Hey everyone, welcome to KubeCon, the big show of the year. Maybe not the biggest show of the year, but one of the big shows of the year. And today I am lucky to have two people from Amazon Web Services, people who I've known a little bit over the years in terms of Bob Wise, General Manager of Kubernetes AWS, who's here. Hey, Bob. Hey there, how's it going? It's great. Uh, I remember, Bob, you, from your Samsung days when you were there and you were talking about control planes a little bit uh, in those early days. And I'm excited to talk about with you the evolution of control planes and the AWS environment with Kubernetes. And Bob, again, is general manager of Kubernetes at AWS. And also joining us is Peter Ulander. Hey, Peter. Hey, good to see you, Alex. Good to see you. And, and Peter is CMO, General Manager, Head of Enterprise and Developer uh, Product Management Marketing. Yeah, I, th I think you're upgrading my title. Uh, sounds like you might be grabbing something off of LinkedIn. So I, I run um, product marketing for our enterprise developer and open source initiatives at AWS. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. Well, um, here we are. So thank you both for joining us. We appreciate your time. And I'm looking forward to discussing a few topics, but I'm really curious about Amazon Web Services and its view on Kubernetes and how it plays into the company's open source strategy. Uh, Peter, uh, we've known each other a long time. And, and when we were reacquainted again, you had recently joined uh, AWS and you were leading a lot of the open source efforts there and and you still are. And I'm interested in like getting an idea, for instance, on, you know, how Kubernetes is evolving in the overall market from your point of view. And with it, you know, what is the deeper need for uh, for open source technologies? So maybe I'll just start it off that, you know, with a question for you, Bob, about the patterns that you're seeing from customers that are reflected in some of the announcements that we've seen about Kubernetes in the past few months. Sure. Uh, you know, from the early days, even even before we launched EKS, there have been customers building, uh, building systems in production with Kubernetes. Uh, and and uh, since the early days of EKS, we had customers who went to production um, very rapidly, pr probably in part because they had experience uh, running Kubernetes on their own um, on AWS at that point. Uh, but I would say just generally across the last uh, 18 months even, there's been a kind of noticeable shift from um, customers worrying about kind of what it was going to take to get a thing running in production for the first time, the first application, the first thing, the first team really using it um, uh, at scale to uh, running multiple teams, lots of clusters, big clusters. And so I think we've seen uh, just a lot of scale up, both in terms of the number of clusters and uh, the size of clusters, um, especially from some, from some of our big customers. So just a quick follow-up, what are the differences that you're seeing in customer interests as they scale up their clusters? Uh, sure. I, I mean, I think it's uh, it, it, it starts turning into... Lots of questions about security, um, uh, concerns about, uh, you know, for, for some orgs, they'll be very, very careful about security uh, before they even launch. Uh, but lots of customers are, uh, you know, kind of willing to figure it out as they go along. And then they start to realize, wow, uh, we have an awful lot riding on the system now. We, we should be sure we understand it. Um, so more conversations that way, of course, like that's a, that is job zero for any AWS service team is uh, managing managing secu uh, security. Um, it's a big part of our job because um, we do like our, our main job is to help customers run Kubernetes in a secure way. Um, and of course, as Kubernetes has gotten bigger and bigger, has become a more attractive target um, out there. Uh, it's it's a bigger target, and so the community generally has been doing a lot more work there. We're we're very engaged with the uh, upstream community, um, specifically around security. So um, I, I think security concerns are a, a very good indication of um, uh, 
when customers are starting to make big bets on a technology, they start getting really concerned about the security um, aspects of it. Peter, is that reflected in the open source approach that you're thinking about with uh, AWS? Um, what are some of the attitudes you've seen shift over the past few years in open source, especially as you've you know, been involved in the Kubernetes ecosystem in particular? Absolutely. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a couple of perspectives because it, it's been fun to see the change happening, both from a customer perspective as well as from an AWS perspective. Um, but in true Amazonian uh, uh, behavior, I'll start with the customer and work backwards. Mm -hmm. And I think what, what, what's interesting is um, the transition to the cloud, this whole move around digital transformation um, have push customers to be more open to the types of technology stacks and 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 things that they're investing in um, uh, across their business. And that means in many ways, they're, they're looking uh, in their process of modernization, they're looking to open source technologies to not just fill the gaps that they had with their existing um, uh, components, but they're looking to open source um, as effectively kind of being that jetpack that helps them innovate so much faster. Um, and so when, when we first engage or whenever we engage with customers, there's always a conversation around is my favorite open source capability technology platform tool available on AWS? And I would say that just in the last seven months, given the pandemic, that push towards faster digital transformation has actually increased the velocity of questions and interest we get from an open source perspective and open source at Amazon um, uh, as customers grow. And I think when it really, when it comes down to the core, what we get from customers are a is my is is my favorite project available on AWS, but two, how is Amazon or AWS going to help me um, embrace, engage, use this open source, and how am I going to be able to rest you know be assured that that we're working on the most stable current upstream release. And I think that's a, that's a big reason why you, you hear from Bob talking about the fact that he's engaged in the Kubernetes environment, working on upstream um, uh, uh, contributions as well as consumption and giving that confidence to customers that show not only are we going to help them with making sure open source runs on AWS, but we are going to actively participate in these communities to advance the cause and maintain kind of fidelity with these upstream deployments. And that speaks a lot to kind of uh, Amazon's um, uh, kind of attitudes. I, would just, I wouldn't go as far as to say they've shifted. We've relied on open source from the very beginning. Um, I always like to say that, you know, cloud and open source, they kind of go hand in hand. It's like peanut butter and chocolate or, um, you know, pick your favorite analogy. Um, but I think what we've been better at in the last couple of years is becoming far more publicly engaged or or community engaged with a lot of our initiatives. And I think, you know, the 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 coolest part for me, um, and, and one of the things that, that I get I get excited about the work I've been doing over the past year is seeing our development leadership, um, our, our engineers uh, becoming more active participants in the direction of where open source projects are running. So, for example, Bob, of course, sits on the CNCF board and has a number of his teams that are very, very engaged in the in the various um, CNCF projects. Uh, we've got an entire team focused on the CNCF Open Telemetry project, and we have two members that are sitting on the board um, and on the technical um, uh, the technical committee in that front. And then, you know, there's even these where, where you might have thought it was more of a conflicted relationship. I'll pick Redis, for example. Um, there's a long public perception of how we engage with Redis, but in reality, we have, we have folks like, um, uh, uh, Madeline on one of our, one of our teams. It's actually now on the PMT of Redis and helping them basically define how to push that project forward. So there's been, far more openness for, for our developers to engage, drive, and innovate with the community around various open source initiatives. Hmm. A lot to observe. Can I, can I add on a couple yeah. of things yeah. there? A little specific? Yeah, so, um, I, so one is uh, we're one of the etcd maintainers. So uh, whatever analogy uh, Peter was just using about you know peanut butter and chocolate or peanut butter and jelly, uh, etcd and Kubernetes are even more tightly integrated than that. Um, you know, running a uh, 
managed Kubernetes service at scale is really largely about running uh, the NCD database system uh, at scale, and we're, we're one of the maintainers there. Um, there there's been, though, uh, I think another shift that is uh, worth pointing out, uh, which is really about the Kubernetes community itself, the Kubernetes project uh, itself, and how that's been changing here in recent years as a result of um, kind of growth and maturation. And that is that the, the community really wants to push more things outside of the Kubernetes core. Um, there have been, you know, like the more stuff is in Kubernetes overall, including like the core bits and the outside bits, the harder it is for the project to go fast and concentrate on, uh, on essential things. And so that's where you see activity around pushing this. I don't know if you've seen this phrase out of tree. Um, this is, uh, you know, project slang for intentionally taking bits of the project and pushing them outside the project where other folks can kind of take those bits, run with them, uh, modify them more quickly without kind of getting entangled with um, the core project velocity. Um, good architecture, good good teams, good process is often about decoupling. And there's been a lot of very thoughtful work put into um, decoupling these pieces from each other. Um, and so that's why you'll see uh, projects from us um, like the CNI, uh, the CSI drivers, CNI drivers, um, the ingress controller, these are things that we release as open source that are really uh, kind of like just on the periphery. They're out of tree uh, by design to help us be able to uh, go faster and uh, support all the users who need those. Um, and, and those projects, by the way, are um, not used just by EKS customers. They're used by uh, customers much more broadly than that. It reminds me of a few years ago when the conversation in the Kubernetes community among the leadership focused on the Kubernetes core and making the Kubernetes core as simple and as focused as you could you could possibly make it. And so then you could allow it could allow you then to then have these interfaces such as networking interfaces and storage interfaces. And so that seems to be what we're getting at here, isn't it? Um, to some extent, we're starting to see this out of tree um, model evolve. You you can kind of uh, you can kind of think of it a little bit like Linux in the sense that there's the Linux kernel and then there's user space and uh, there's a lot more a uh, lot more different things in different ways to package and different things that people include in the user space uh, packaging. Um, but the uh, the kind of core kernel bits are considerably more common. Um, and and one of the one of the outcomes of that or one of the reasons to think in that direction is the core bits start to get really, really tricky. And um, we were talking earlier about security, right? If you go too fast on some of those things, it's easy to introduce uh, security vulnerabilities. So for the core piece, it's, it is actually important to um, slow down the pace of feature innovation and concentrate on stability and scale and security and some of these things that become more important as um, Kubernetes has become a you know really critical uh, system for all kinds of applications. And that was the parallel I was thinking about too with the Linux kernel, and we've seen a lot of interest in eBPF and and you know, and the projects that are emerging from that and all the different things that people are doing. And uh, it gets to a lot of questions too about overhead and what is that, uh, you know, and, and the, the, the optimization, you know, of the resources themselves, which helps me turn to a question about Fargate. And just before we started recording, we were talking about serverless and, and, uh, we were talking a little bit about uh, Bob from your point of view, um, how the how the concept around serverless has changed a lot, and how is that how is that apparent uh, when when we talk to you at AWS about Fargate and and the and, the, and its evolution? Do you want me to jump on this one, Peter? Sure. All right. Um, yeah, I think uh, serverless has come to mean. Uh, uh, additional things. Uh, so it, it, it variously means either uh, kind of event-based um, programming model, uh, something like Lambda, which supports that, but it's also um, 
come to me and really, how is it that we provide um, all kinds of automation to help customers not manage servers, um, but even more broadly than just servers? How do we provide maximum automation, take that toy off the plates of our customers and uh, do, th do great things automatically? Um, you know, I, I, this question about like, I don't know, uh, serverless versus not, and uh, you know all the various different flavors of that. Um, uh, I, I think in reality, our customers end up using the, it's it's the it's the uh, it's the and it's not the or, and it's really important to use the right tool for the job. And uh, I would say, pretty, like most of our customers at scale with production applications, actually use multiple technologies uh, simultaneously. And uh, I think that's exactly right. I think that's very healthy. You should use the right tool for the job, not start with the tool and then decide like you're going to fit every fit every problem into the tool set. Um, so uh, you know, in some in some cases, a, a, a system like Fargate is um, w one of the ways we provide a lot of the operational benefits is by having a very opinionated uh, approach to the way the automation works, um, and. Uh, that also comes with some restrictions. Um, this is this is the normal trade-off in almost any kind of automation system. If you use the automation kind of the way it's intended, you can get a lot of benefits. But sometimes you have a specific reason to say, "No, I need to do something special." Um, you know, sometimes often it's often the case that customers start with those um, uh, start with that uh, approach, and then they kind of run into some use case where they need to do something special, more customized, and then they they use um, a piece of the system that is designed for that. Um, so you might look at, for example, with um, with EKS, you have both EKS on EC2 and you have EKS on Fargate, and they have different trade-offs. So you get a higher level of automation, a more opinionated approach. You get a different security uh, setup. Uh, you get a, a pod per micro VM, for example, which has a lot of security benefits. Um, but there are times when you want more than one pod on a machine, and in that case, you can use EC2. So. You know, really for us, it's about providing um, a bunch of good sets of tools. Um, I, uh, I'll also uh, mention, I, I should have mentioned it earlier um, that with your question about open source projects. One, one of the uh, open source projects that um, is in developer preview, preview right now is a system called ACK. Um, this is the Amazon controllers for Kubernetes. Um, and this is really designed for customers who are taking a Kubernetes-centric approach for how they're doing their pipelines and configuration management, um, their GitOps approach. Um, but what they want is to use AWS services as part of that. And one of the one of the AWS services that we're uh, rolling out as part of that um, is Lambda. So we're really trying to make it easier and easier for customers to uh, actually use multiple technologies together in the same system. I'm more interested in uh, serverless as as a, an extension uh, progr of programmable infrastructure. And one of the advantages that uh, you have in container-based environments is uh, the statelessness that, you, that you're offered. And it gets a lot more compl complicated when you're dealing with state. And, you know, we've run some articles on serverless and, and state, but I'm curious about, you know, the approaches that you're seeing customers interested in as they use Kubernetes, but also are using maybe your VPC, right? So they're thinking about how do they, you know, how do they keep this serverless approach in stateful environments? And it's just a question that I that I see coming up, especially you know, you just consider the market and you know how many customers out there are using Java, for instance, and you know, and Java was what what was built for for, for stateful environments. I, I think um, stateful, you know, you probably, you've been watching Kubernetes for a while, you know, that things like, uh, well, it's not called this anymore, but uh, it was called pet sets back in the, back in the early days. And it has right. become stateful sets that supporting stateful applications was one of the really early uh, efforts within the Kubernetes community um, because I'll say real applications need state. Um, I, I think that's also the case. I, I don't have um, I don't have any numbers off off the tips of my fingers here, but um, it's certainly my sense from talking to customers that it's very common to have uh, Lambda um, accessing a database. Like that's probably the that's probably the most that's probably a highly common pattern. Um, so it's not a matter of the applications being stateless. It's just kind of like how have you architected? Where are you saving the state? Um, are you saving the state in the inside the runtime thing, or are you using a, a different system? So. Um, 
you know, you, you'll see this uh, also in a lot of the announcements that uh, we've done even for the past year. Uh, the CSI drivers, um, the support we did for EFS, for example, EFS and Fargate is uh, largely because um, Fargate, a Fargate user is not interested in just building a stateless application. They want to build stateful applications as well. So adding um, EFS support uh, for those uh, stateful applications for, uh, for Fargate uh, is critical. Peter, what uh, what's on your mind here? I mean, you 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 probably are having conversations with product groups all the time on on these types of topics when when it comes to thinking about you know how to integrate open source projects and how to think about cluster management in these environments. And how do you think about you know the the just laundry list of of matters that are. Bef- are before a customer every day when they're thinking about building out a distributed infrastructure and using Kubernetes. Yeah, I, I think from my perspective, I'm I'm in a fortunate seat, right? I, I happen to sit on the the sales and marketing side versus the engineering side, and we're very fortunate that our our uh, developers and service teams are fully indoctrinated in open source, and they focus on that 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 part of it. Where I'm coming from really kind of pushes in on ease of use, right? One of the things that cloud and specifically AWS brings to our customers is we make open source extremely approachable and usable. And whether that's through delivering managed services of existing open source packages or like like what Bob started talking about with regards to Fargate or ACK or, you know, uh, these, these integrations in the technology, it's all about empowering our, our customers, our developers to do more with the stacks. Um, and I was, I was thinking, uh, as, as Bob was talking through just some of, uh, some of, some of the technology advancements and how cool that is. Um, I, I'm reminded actually, you know, what's the customer impact? And I recently, uh, did a story that talked a little bit about Coca Cola and their work within, with AWS. And the short of it is, um, they wanted to create effectively a, a contactless, um, experience for customers that were in stores, picked five guys standing in front of those um, connected uh, dispensary machines and actually, you know, order their drink via their phone versus actually touching anything, which is important in today's day and age. And I, I think what was fascinating in that story is it, there's a whole smattering of cloud services, open source capabilities, as well as a user experience. And they were able to get from zero to implementation, zero to cup, the way they kind of talk about it in less than a hundred days. Right. Zero to deployment with a customer facing application that's fully usable by anyone today in less than 100 days. And what's fascinating is, you know, that's Coca-Cola. We could we could we could go through the same thing for McDonald's or Expedia or Orange Theory. These are all consumer based companies that are driving, you know, new experiences to their user base. They, in many cases, they're forced to create new experiences based on, on just some of the situations we're in. And we're providing them with platforms where they're not worried about the, the, how do I configure this or how do I manage the clusters or how do I, you know, set up these environments? They're coming in with code and they're innovating quickly. And that's kind of, you know, that's, that's, that's the goal that our customers want to achieve. So, Bob, you know, I was watching an old presentation from four years ago, and you were talking about control plane engineering. And the control, the, the concept of the control plane has evolved quite a bit, and, it's, and it continues to evolve. How does the evolution of the control plane factor into a Coca-Cola or, or a customer out there who's building out their approach and building out their Kubernetes infrastructure, especially when you consider... The, these heterogeneous environments that, that they're working in. What are some of the patterns that you're seeing and, and how is that reflected in what you're doing at AWS? Sure. Uh, yeah, back, back to my days as uh, one of the uh, co-chairs for Six Scalability, where we were worrying quite a lot about how do we make sure Kubernetes will scale up to where a bunch of us imagined it would be. And it's you know one of the really fun things about my job to see it actually get there um, at scale. And so, um, you know, I think, uh, uh, you know, there, there's presentations we've done in public, by the way, t- talking about how we, at, as part of the EKS team, manage and configure the control planes. Of, uh, there's a lot to do there to get it really right um, for, you know, scalability, uh, scalability and availability um, 
that's probably a talk for its own time. Um, but I would mm -hmm. say we have been we have been pushed in both directions by our customers, um, and this is actually one of the kind of interesting customer questions debates. I would say somewhat of an unanswered question in the um, in the deployers of Kubernetes at scale, which is um, deploy fewer bigger clusters or deploy lots and lots of smaller clusters. And uh, they both have their trade-offs. Uh, we see customers going in both directions. Of course, the interesting thing for the for the uh, EKS team is uh, we don't get to pick one or the other. We, we have to do both. Um, so, uh, you know, for example, I have an entire team who does nothing but work on um, large-scale clusters. And how do you um, scale clusters up and down? Um, how do you scale clusters up and down really fast? And uh, that's that's actually a, an interesting um, intersection between cloud and Kubernetes is you have the system that's really brilliant at being able to kind of change the size of a cluster and do it really fast. Mm -hmm. And so this means, um, for example, uh, here, here's here's another another conversation we have a lot um, you know, customers that are moving really large, really big clusters um, from an on prem environment into an on cloud environment and uh, there, you can't think about it the same way. Uh, well, you can think about it the same way, but you end up spending a lot more money because you don't want to have thousands of nodes, uh, thousands of EC2 instances uh, sitting around doing nothing. Um, in a in a data center environment, you've bought the servers; they're going to sit there. So the the the, the general approach has been fewer bigger cl clusters because it makes it a little bit easier to to share the nodes. But in a in a cloud environment. Um, it's uh, a lot more cost efficient to have uh, cluster auto scaling um, kick in and scale the cluster up and down as the as the cluster needs it, and uh, you can be a whole lot more efficient. But it does mean on large clusters you have to understand exactly what you're doing and how that works and what the implications are to your application. And this is there's no one size fits all here because some customers are much more cost sensitive and they want to make sure that they're running as efficiently as possible. And a little bit of lack of responsiveness is. Uh, it's fine, and other customers are running very, uh, very sensitive, performance-sensitive operations, and they want to stay ahead of it. So um, that's another place we see uh, kind of a lot of interesting, um, a lot of interesting customer conversations and and uh, work being done. That's interesting. It really then speaks to kind of the the need to be able to have, you know, the best automation in the world, really, and for the best automation that you could provide, you need to be able to be thinking about topics that you know were present a few years ago but now are much more relevant now and i think of telemetry for instance uh, is a very hot topic and i'm curious about you know aws and its approach to projects such as you know, open telemetry and the open te telemetry community it's an it's an area of interest uh, for the readers of the new stack and peter i'm wondering if this reflects on uh, on what you're seeing as well with customers Absolutely. You know, I, I, I think observability to your, to your point is, is a super hot topic right now. At the end of the day, um, there's a lot of work going into, uh, re-instrumentation and rebuilding of applications as they move them to the cloud or they move into new modern environments. And one of the things that's really important in these highly distributed, loosely coupled type, um, uh, environments is the ability to actually see what your code does in, 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 um, uh, or, or how it behaves under various stresses or various environments. And that basically means that we fundamentally have to rethink, um, you, you know, the tooling or we, we have to get to standards quickly that enables the developers to, to have the components that drive consistency around metrics and traces and logs that can be consumed by existing monitoring applications or some of the, the newer, more current things. And I think open telemetry or the open telemetry project is definitely working down that path of, of, uh, effect, uh, effectively standardizing those, those core elements observability. And we're really excited to be, be part of it. Um, and, you know, from an Amazon, from an Amazon perspective or an AWS perspective, we're, we're investing heavily in the project. Um, we, uh, we're focused, you know, A, we have a, this, this mantra of 100% upstream first policy. So we are, you know, extremely engaged in the direction of where the community is going and how it impacts the solutions that or services that we introduce from AWS. Um, this dedicated engineering team has been working on doing things like improving logging 
uh, capabilities inside of open telemetry or driving integration into the Prometheus project for, um, for the capturing of, of a lot of that information. Um, and, and I think I mentioned before, we've got a couple of, uh, core engineers, um, uh, Alalita and Jana are in the, the working group and really kind of helping move this forward. So I'm, I'm really excited for where the project is going from an, from an AWS perspective. I don't know if you, you caught it. I think it was about a week to two weeks ago. We actually in, introduced, um, uh, uh, we introduced the AWS distro for open telemetry, which mm-hmm. effectively is a packaging of the open telemetry project integrated in with a number of AWS services. We're working to localize the platform across 10 languages. And then, you know, ultimately, um, really kind of, kind of create an observability stack that works seamlessly with Lambda, with EKS, with, with ECS, all of our container services and enables developers to, to, uh, standardize, um, their telemetry pieces, uh, in a way that basically, you know, enables them to understand the behavior, but also it plugs into existing monitoring and, and logging solutions that are already out there. So we're excited about it. These, these continuous loops, Bob, this uh, continuous feedback process, it's so, uh, it's so critical in this new world that, you know, you're, we're talking about. And at some point, the, the, the iterative loops become almost important to learn by themselves and i th- that's one of the evolutions you know that is clearly apparent is why machine learning is becoming more popular it just allows you to sync things better allows you to update things faster allows you to automate and manage environments how is that playing with kubernetes management now because what we're talking a lot about is is this direction uh, well, uh, we were talking about ACK, for example. Um, that's a, a key piece of the ACK design is a controller loops with convergence. Um, this is the uh, reason you've seen us be uh, so supportive of GitOps and the Flux project, mm. uh, because this way of working, the, you know, the, the GitOps, GitOps is really kind of, kind of a, I'll, I'll say it's a marketing term for some well understood uh, uh, practices, but kind of all put together in a somewhat more opinionated way. And, you know, the, the key things there are to have to be using the properties, the immutable properties of containers and a declarative approach. More generally, use a system like Kubernetes that has convergence, convergence built in to the way it works. Um, take a declarative approach uh, and then have the robots do the work to constantly uh, be uh, converging the system to the state that the humans have set um, in, in the declarations. Uh, and then, of course, infrastructure as code is a part of it using a source control system to manage the kind of key declarative um, intents from the from the humans. So really, this is, um, uh, you know, I, I think this is a similar trend. Uh, if you look at uh, the re- Kubernetes is essentially an early kind of like not that smart a robot, but it is really an IT operations uh, robotic system. And one of the interesting things that, that is happening is that as people are um, adapting to, to working with it, it's a bit like um, it, it's a bit like working with robots in other environments. It becomes about like what's the right interface between the humans and the robots. Managing robots to do the work is different than doing the work yourself. And I think that really is the uh, that really is kind of the main that is the main theme of transformation that's happening in the IT industry. Uh, Generally, but is also touching other industries. Um, if you look at um, autonomous vehicles, for example, you know, how, how is it that you actually manage fleets of autonomous vehicles? Uh, so it's a very interesting, very interesting times with a lot of kind of similar activities going on in different markets at the same time. You know, Brandon from uh, who's at Red Hat now, uh, whose name is the last name is escaping me, who who developed uh, Eats uh, at CD. And was one of the really early architects of, of Kubernetes. And, uh, he, he talks about being in high school and, uh, building a giant robot. And, uh, you know, and I, and, and they got in a load of trouble for their, their giant robot, but it was, uh, interesting kind of a thought process to think about when you're thinking about what you're saying with the, with, with, you know, with this description of these robots and how they were, Kubernetes really is an early days robot. So I'm curious on what that gives your thoughts about Kubernetes overall. 
and how it is going to evolve, how you see it evolving uh, over time. Uh, you know, for instance, uh, etcd, you know, perhaps you could help us understand a little bit more about etcd and how it plays into this concept of a robot and how you see the, the idea of the robot evolving as uh, these processes just become just too complex to manage just manually. Yeah, so um, so let's start with etcd. I think that's probably the easy part. Um, etcd is the core data store um, uh, that's, that's uh, I'll, I'll say it this way, part of Kubernetes. Um, it is the most common way to deploy Kubernetes. Um, there is some really good kind of architectural decoupling built into the Kubernetes and etcd relationship. Um, the connectivity to etcd, for example, goes through the API server. Um, it really is kind of a, a piece that has evolved to be special purpose for the needs of something like Kubernetes. Uh, important piece of it is this concept of a watch where as different parts of the system, the state changes, there's different, there's different controllers. Those controllers that are constantly um, running loops looking for the state of things need a state to be looking at and etcd kind of provides the, the foundation for that. So it really is, it really is a fundamental piece. Um, I think one of the interesting things we're seeing in the uh, Kubernetes world uh, is, uh, is this notion of um, what, like, what does it mean to be running applications on multiple clusters simultaneously? Um, there's, of course, been a lot of activity around service meshes. Um, uh, we have a service mesh uh, offering uh, called App Mesh. Um, we've been investing a lot in that. Um, and I think there's an interesting ongoing debate about whether uh, the, the, that kind of service mesh capability should be kind of built into Kubernetes itself on that. That um, debate is kind of raging with raging on kind of within the community. Um, for my own sake, I would say uh, that is probably the way to do it. Um, the more invisible uh, the service mesh is, the more easily available it is, the advantages you get in terms of you know security and so forth. Um, the more integrated that is into the system the system beneath, um, like we do with App Mesh, um, the kind of easier it is for customers to to get get at those advantages. So. Um, you know, I, I think the kind of evolution of the Kubernetes project from being what is mostly a single cluster project today to a project that is really kind of embracing what does it mean to be having applications run across multiple clusters, um, the implications on service meshes. Um, and then I think we'll, we'll continue to see um, both. Uh, we'll also continue to see bigger and bigger clusters um, come from the project as well. Ah, uh, Peter, now... I'd like to turn back to the beginning of our conversation when we were talking about security. And when you think about robots, you think security becomes pretty important. You don't want the people to get access to the robots who should not be having access to the robots. And you don't want the robots to be able to get out and just cause a, a, a fracas. I could just picture this idea of like a, a virtual robot running around and, and I'm, there are actually some interesting stories about, I think, competing automated systems inside distributed environments and what can happen when uh, thing, things uh, get mi too mixed up. Uh, but I'm curious about this topic of, you know, security when you're thinking about applying patches to your, cl to your cluster control plane. You know, you work closely with the, with the community to ensure critical security issues are addressed before new releases and, and patches are de deployed. So what are some of the examples of the work that you're doing to ensure critical security issues, are, you know, are mitigated, resolved and uh, taken care of quickly? Yeah. I, uh, so what I'm going to do here is I'll suggest that we go over to the expert with Bob because security is, sure. is hugely important to us. And, you know, I, I know he has to, he has to go through, you know, all types of things around the security topic on a daily basis. So, so why don't we, why don't we hear from Bob? I was saying there, there are a couple of topics here. So one is um, how, like, what is, what is all the work that we do in order to keep the uh, kind of underlying system as secure as possible? And um, that is a lot of work we do uh, in all kinds of different ways. Uh, Peter was mentioning uh, our review process, um, how careful we are about qualifying things. We have, you know, the, the entire team's job security is when, when we say security is job zero, um, uh, this has been, I would say, re really almost the most interesting thing for me. I, I've been at AWS about three years. The most impressive thing about AWS is um, how deep the security obsession 
the runs. Like we don't just have security teams off to the side. Everybody's job is security and we really we operate that way. And there's no substitute for having a, a development and operational culture that works that way. And so we have lots and lots and lots of processes that are, that are based on that. Um, I, I think the, the thing that um, I'm going to talk about here is um, regardless, these are general purpose compute systems. You can always configure them. Um, they, they need to be configured in ways that are completely flexible. And so um, how do we help our customers ensure that they have the right security controls and audits and what are the recommended practices that we have? Um, I'm going to pull this conversation um, back to um, back to the GitOps topic again, because sure. the, the GitOps approach has a, a very interesting property to it, which is um, you don't have people going into systems and changing things. Um, you have declarative intent. You have humans review it. And by the way, in whether you're looking at operational stability or security practices, there's no substitute for more than one set of eyes. Um, and so that's why practices like code reviews are so important because you need multiple perspectives to get things right um, and to be safe. So the, the idea of having a, your, your change control for your clusters, for your applications, go through this process of here's the change I want having multiple humans look at it and then having automation actually implement the changes that the humans have looked at to avoid mistakes is really critical. Um, I, I've, uh, I've been reading studies recently uh, about how the, the most common security, this by the way, reflects my experience uh, just generally as well. Like the most security incidents are caused by human beings um, screwing something up, making a mistake. Um, that's why having multiple eyes on things is, uh, matters so much. Um, you know, I, I would also say the the one of the biggest differences between high velocity orgs and everybody else is that high velocity orgs um, start to become really terrified whenever human beings are touching software on the way to production, and um, lots of other orgs, the ones that haven't crossed the crossed the chasm yet, get really concerned when human beings aren't touching it. And so, I, I think if you're looking at that, like how, how is it that how is it that you kind of maybe this is even the way we should be talking about cloud native? Like, what does it mean to be cloud native? I would say, if I had to pick one thing, it would be that. Um, but the security benefits of operating that way are really tremendous. So it isn't really almost a, a separate topic. It's um, how do you manage all of these things together in, in kind of a, a holistic way? Um, yeah, that really is a critical element there, and you know we hear it a lot yeah. from SR. You know, for instance, with SREs, like. You know, you get rewarded the less operations you have to do. So, real quick, Alex, because I'd love to yeah. jump on that because I think what, what what what's important is we take a look at security. I mean, it's obviously a top priority for us, and it's intrinsic to everything that we do. Built in, it's one of our value props. But what's interesting is when you're looking at developers that are building their own services and going out with security, has to be a core element of that. And as Bob pointed out. Um, you know, the more hands that get involved or eyeballs that get involved in this um, or human interaction, the more chances for issue uh, comes up. So uh, I think it was, dare I say, a, f a few months back, we released something called Code Guru. Um, this is out of our ML team. So we were talking about ML earlier, and I think this is this is really, really critical. Uh, they, the Code Guru product has two components. One is the profiler and one is the reviewer. And the way they basically work is you can actually insert, so reviewer, for example, you can insert code review code reviewer as a, an ML driven code review for applications that are going through the pipelines and on, on the way to production. And the review goes in and basically looks for license compliance, security compliance, flaws in, in, in the systems or vulnerabilities, et cetera, and actually helps you remediate before you actually go out into production. So that's really key with regards to leveraging, you know, machine learning as a, as a process to, to, to really kind of, you know, remove those pairs of hands in a high velocity environment. Profiler takes it to one, one additional or takes it one, one, one step further. What profiler does, um, is it actually goes in and, and 
compares your code against best practices to ensure that you're not spending too much money. Again, that you've addressed the security vulnerabilities that were part of the code review um, and really optimize the performance of the application as you as you move into production and ultimately at scale, all driven with an ML engine that basically removes those pairs of hands and, and really kind of um, uh, embraces or enables that whole view of a high velocity organization. As we finish up, I wanted to just get some thoughts about where you see yourself going forward with the open source story at AWS. And it's wonderful to see you so involved in open source communities. Tell us about AWS reInvent, for instance. Is there anything you can talk to us about, you know, the role that open source will play at the event? I think people are pretty watching pretty closely on what you all are up to. Yeah. And, and, Alex, I always love you for asking that question, but as the marketing guy, I got to come back and say, I, I can't spill the beans just yet. Um, uh, but there is no question that uh, top of mind for our executives and what you'll see in, in both Andy and Werner's keynotes will be topics that range from various open source initiatives to the things that we're doing in the Kubernetes and containers environments to how we're uh, engaging in many of the topics that we went through today. Um, and if there's any kind of preview for some of this stuff, um, I, I mentioned the work we're doing with open telemetry. Uh, Bob mentioned the, the work we're doing around a public registry that was announced at the beginning of this week. Um, and, and definitely a lot of the different things that are, that we're working on within the, the Kubernetes front. So. And Bob, uh, maybe a last question for you on, you know, I, I didn't ask much about service mesh. It's such an interesting topic now. Uh, for me in particular, I'm looking at how it intersects, for instance, with hardware more and how service mesh and the network and programmability are all really starting to intersect in a very interesting way. And just curious on your last thoughts on that and, and, and open source projects that are relating to service mesh and where your, you know, where your investment is. Right. Well, uh, we, I, I, I think we haven't mentioned the Envoy word yeah. here yet. Um, App Mesh is, uh, is a control plane uh, for Envoy. So we're also involved um, and very engaged in the Envoy community as a result. Um, you know, I think, I think the service mesh is, uh, this is a whole topic maybe you should have us back. Yeah. Um, you know, it touches many of these topics. Uh, it touches continuous deployment and GitOps, um, you know, uh, using service meshes to do progressive deployments and rollbacks, um, build canaries, uh, uh, observability is really critical, security. So uh, service mesh is pretty much top touch all of these. Um, but it's still a little bit early days. Uh, uh, and I, I think uh, there is an awful lot more uh, service mesh uh, adoption to be done. I think it's pretty clear, uh, although it's early days right now, service meshes are going to be kind of a standard part of, um, of every cluster deployment, uh, you know, in the coming years as well. Yeah, let's let's talk again about service mesh another time. I'm fascinated, for instance, with smart mix now and and their evolution and and there's just a whole you know whole list of discussions we could have. I want to thank you both for joining us today, uh, Bob Wise. Uh, thank you so much for your time. It's it's great to have you on the show. And Peter Ulander, uh, Peter, great great to see you here. And thanks for thanks for joining us. Always great to speak with you, Alex. Thanks for having us.